We'll return to the held items. And the first item was a procedural hold uh, under item 182, Board of Selectmen, specifically in line item 570, transfers to economic development stabilization. Votes to stabilization require a two-thirds vote. Uh, there being no further discussion, all those in favor of line item 182 slash 570 signify by saying aye. All those opposed, so voted and declared unanimous. That takes care of 182. And now to the heart of the matter, line item 300 and, uh, and Dr. Price. Gordon Price, 48 Manlot Road. Um, before I address that, I'd just like to um, compliment the town administrator, I think, on a very uh, comprehensive uh, presentation and thank the town administrator for uh, implementing programs that will make it a lot easier for residents to communicate with town hall and vice versa. So thank you very much. Um, in the advisory committee uh, brochure, page 34, I just have some questions on equipment and repairs. Um, under administration, equipment and repairs shows uh, 58,769. Are the repair items listed under the individual schools in that amount or are those separate? Uh, those would, there are some separate ones for uh, small capital items that the schools may spend, larger, smaller capital items, again, that we may spend. So that's essentially equipment repair. It, it's things such as uh, floor refinishers um, that, we, that we have to get, replacing uh, dishwashers that break in the, in the cafeteria. And again, you can see that there are, there are small ones in individual schools, and these vary from year to year depending upon um, what may break at a particular time. We try to plan for these, but it's not always that easy because you don't always know what's gonna go. Okay, thank you. Um, hopefully I don't sound like a broken record because I think I've been up here in years past talking about repairs. Yeah. Um, to my uh, math figure is 58,769. It represents a little bit less than 2% of the total school budget. Um, I just hope that in your planning and in your budgeting that you're looking at um, sufficient numbers for repairs over the years so that you know our grandchildren, great-grandchildren, 30 years down the road from now won't be looking at another $100,000 $110,000 to build a you know, potential of a new school. So you know, I would ju just ask that that, that um, number, whatever it is, uh, be kept in, in mind so we can have adequate repairs and maintenance to our school system because they are expensive to, to repair and replace. So thank you very much. And you know, you'll be happy to know that we have a, uh, we've instructed our director of maintenance and business manager this year to actually present a five-year uh, maintenance and repair plan for the school department to the school committee. Um, so it's something that we are undertaking so that we can plan for these better than respond to these. Great, thank you. <laughs> Speaker to my right. Ms. Burbine. Oh, You're on. <laughs> Ann Burbine, 10 Pennycrest Road. As a former member of the advisory board, having been to many selectmen's meetings, budget meetings, et cetera, et cetera, on page 34 that Mr. Price alluded to, this is the first time that we have actually had, in my memory, a breakdown of what it cost between school, school, and school. And to that, I commend Mr. McCarthy for having done this. Information and communication are so important. Thank you. Okay. I see it's still lurking over there, but not yet. All right. Uh, any other questions on item 300? There being none, all those in favor of line item 300 as presented signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed? So voted and declared unanimous. We come now to item 400. Scott Greenbaum, 40 Damon Road. Uh, this last week in the Mariner, there was an article about $700,000 being spent for sure uh, protection for maintenance and stuff. Um, I'd like to understand how in the, this part of the budget 
there's going to be $700,000 for maintenance. I'd also like to state, I've lived in the Sand Hill areas for 15 years. I've seen DPW out once to do it out with a trowel and concrete to patch the seawalls. All other repairs have been done under capital improvements, either the FEMA money that we got back in 2004 or 5, um, the, the Christmas storm issue that we recently had, and um, th those are the only two times that I can remember large work done. So I'd like to know what uh, is in the plans to actually patch the, the work that we have before it crumbles in front of us, just like we fill potholes in the street. This is infrastructure, it needs to be maintained, and quite frankly, I don't want to spend $25 million when these walls fall down in the next four or five years because they haven't been patched, while they could last for 10, 15, 25 years, and we could actually avoid a lot of work, and I'd like to know what the plans are, how this money's going to be spent, and when we're going to get people out there to do the work, because that's what needs to be done immediately, and we won't have four or five walls that we see out here falling off and breaking off in a storm. Thank you. To answer the speaker's question. Scott, we'll give him a minute. To answer the question, Selectman Murray. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Hi, Scott. Um, using rough numbers, there's the override several years ago, and of that override, 200000 was going for the roads, $200,000 for seawall repair. Earlier this evening, there was $300,000 for the um, from the capital plan for seawalls, and then you know later on tonight, there's another issue as well. There's other monies that we're using for the seawall repair, um, we're going to be receiving uh, $8 million of FEMA reimbursements, and we're going to be on the hook for 25% of that coming from various sources as well. So the short, the long answer is lengthy. The short answer is from the DPW budget itself as the operating, it's on the order of several hundred thousand dollars. The town administrator. To answer the gentleman's specific question, we're actually going out to bid on that street um, in the next few weeks. Yeah, I'm still a little confused because the 300000 is a capital, not a maintenance budget. And the 200000 that we appropriated four years ago was a capital expenditure. I want to know what is maintenance work, plain old filling the potholes. That's the important thing, because that's what needs to be done all over town. And that's a maintenance issue that uh, should be planned for, and there should be a, uh, a way of getting that done within the normal operating budgets of the DPW without going to capital budget and overrides and other aspects of the thing. That's, and it sounds like we don't have any plan to use any of our maintenance money, our operating money, to do any of this work. Madam Finance Director. I'm going to take a crack at it. If I don't make it, you can feel free to ask it again. The uh, money in the operational budget is that money that was in the 2010 override, the $200,000 for um, foreshore protection, $200,000 for roads. It can be used for any purpose, so they can use it for engineering and design of new sections. They can use it for repairs, or they can use it the, the funds towards um, larger maintenance projects beyond just, as you said, a trowel and some cement. Does that help? Are we getting well, closer? That, yeah, that explains 200. I just, that, that's fine. I just don't understand where there's any commitment to actually do maintenance I, of, the, of the equipment, of the infrastructure that we have, just like we maintain our roads. You know, we've maintained boilers, roofs, all types of other things without coming back to this, to the town hall, to the town and ask for specific capital expenditures to take care of something that should be taken care of in the normal operating budget 
and it goes to what will be discussed later, why are we doing that when this should be in our budget right now to maintain that stuff. They're not all capital work that needs to be done to protect our four short stuff. I agree with you. Not everything has to be um, capital, but at this point, the uh, foreshore protection in many places is in such severe condition that it requires the dedication of a great deal of money, and at $4,000 a linear foot estimated to replace um, just seawalls, revetments a little bit less, anything you try to do is very expensive and therefore should come back before town meeting to have a decision whether or not they want to fund it. Yeah, that's if we're replacing, but maintenance and replacement are two different things. Thank you. Okay. Um, Krista Griffin, Lighthouse I, Road, 17 Lighthouse Road. I see Krista Road, over there. I wasn't going to miss you. <laughs> um, I just want to follow up because I, I'm just really looking for a yes or no answer on, do town employees actually patch seawalls as part of work, or is that really something that's not done by the DPW employees, so to speak? I guess that's just, I'm just trying to clarify if any of that is in the day-to-day -day work that's done by employees. The director to answer the question. Kevin Cafferty, Acting Director of Public Works. The DPW usually does not go out and do patching of the seawalls. The seawalls are actually coming apart from the inside on some of them. They were built 60, 70, 80 years ago and the concrete is actually falling apart from the inside out on some of them. There's different issues with each seawall. Um, we've gone over this with the seawall uh, group and explained some of the different areas and the problems that we do have. Um, and if I can, I'll just address the maintenance quickly. Some of the funds that we're looking at, we're looking at off Blades Road, for example, of applying for grants and supplementing some of that money into the grants. We would apply for, say, a $500,000 grant and supplement that with $200,000 for sand implementation on those beaches and try to build the beaches up to where they used to be because over the past years they've dropped. And that's one area where we're working, if that helps. Uh, when you bring that up, I just have one last quick question. On When we have winter storms, a lot of times the sand that comes off of the beach is hauled away. And I'm just wondering, is that a... Once in a while you see they'll dump it on the beach and the majority of the time the sand is hauled away if it comes off of the beach and that probably does add to some of the reduction in the sand that, you know, is actually on the town beaches. So I, I didn't know if there was anything on the, you know, that has to do with when all that sand comes over the wall and then it gets hauled away versus being put back where it came from. The director didn't answer the question of where all the sand goes. Sand is not hauled away. On There have been two occasions where there's been some emergency road repair where we had Glades Road completely open up and we had no access to decent material. And they did place some material in there to protect the roadway and, and make it accessible for emergency vehicles. Other than that, the sand goes back up the beach and it'll go into a town section of area and we'll place it on the beach or as close as we can. We do not necessarily have access to get all the way down the beach and spread it in front of people's homes, if, if that's what you're asking. No, I was really just asking the main, like at the end of Jericho Road where so much sand comes up there, um, I just don't see it being dumped back on the beach. It usually winds up on Oceanside Drive and, and eventually gets over to the beach area. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, I always wondered about that myself. Any other questions on item 400? There being none, this requires a majority vote. All those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed, so vote and declared unanimous. That leaves us with, what was that again? Huh? Oh, I guess that's it. Um, what I'll do, do you have a question? What I'll do is I'll take uh, just sort of one overall affirming vote on the motion that Mr. Harris uh, originally made. All those in favor of the motion originally presented by Selectman Harris signify by saying aye. aye. All those opposed, so voted and declared unanimous. Thank you for your patience through the budget and thank you for everybody for working so hard on it. Article 7, Waterways and Enterprise Fund, Selectman Murray on the motion. Mr. Moderator, 
I move that the town transfer from available funds in waterways enterprise receipts the sum of $922,918 and for the purpose of funding the waterways enterprise fund for the ensuing fiscal year commencing July 1, 2014 as follows. Personal services, $318,564. Other expenses, $604,354. It's been moved. Is there a second? Uh, discussion, Mr. Murray. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. This is an annual uh, article um, to f um, uh, continue with the Waterways Enterprise Fund. This is uh, generated from receipts from the moorings and the slips and other revenues associated with the harbor. And because it's an enterprise fund, the funds are restricted to be used in the harbor. It uh, funds the, the harbor master's office and uh, all other relevant materials. I would also like to take this opportunity, speaking of the harbor master, to uh, formally acknowledge Mr. Mark Patterson, who's been doing a great job this year. as well as the Waterways Commission, which works closely with um, Mr. Patterson and the Board of Selectmen. There are no significant operational changes from last year, and the balance after town meeting in retained earnings uh, will be uh, about $630,000 or so. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. From the Advisory Board, Mr. Westward. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, yeah, basically exactly what he said. Um, there's not much change from over last year. Um, the only thing I would point out that Mark actually does a great job of getting a lot of grants um, and filing the paperwork. One of them you'll be voting on in Article 16 that's come up before, but uh, he really get, gets a, quite a bit of what I call free money um, for the town. So you should thank him. Uh, the advisory committee recommends approval of this article. We had a unanimous vote of seven to zero. Discussion from the floor. There being none, this requires a majority vote. All those in favor signify by saying aye. All those opposed, so voted and declared unanimous. Article 8, on the motion, Mr. Vignani. Bless you. I move that the town transfer from available funds in the Golf Course Enterprise Fund receipts in the sum of $1,242,179 for the purpose of funding Widow Walk Golf Course for the ensuing fiscal year commencing July 1, 2014. Personal services in the amount of $177,830 and other expenses in the amount of $1,064,349. Second, Mr. Danahy, discussion. Selectman Vignani. Um, just a quick, enterprise funds are uh, an accounting um, tool that towns have where all of the funds and all the expenses have to be related to that entity. So the golf course runs its, its own little separate business. Its revenues are projected to be $1.3 million. The five-year average is about $1.24 million. 83% of that revenue comes from uh, greens fees and carts. Um, as most of you probably can guess, that the revenue is re very weather dependent. Our prices are very competitive, and they're uh, usually less, if not equal, to the local uh, competition. Expenses are running or projected to be a million three, of which uh, 476,000 of that is the contract for the people that maintain the golf course, and 380,000 dollars of that is debt and interest from when we purchased the golf course. That debt expires in 2017, so in a couple of years, we're going to have about 380,000 dollars worth of less of expense. Um, the retained earnings in that account right now is $3,000. Um, their goals are to uh, do some capital improvements. They always talk about the clubhouse and the, improving the parking lot, and I think in 2017 some of that might come, come true. And a few other things that they do is they, they host the Situate High School golf team and they are involved heavily in the recreational programs. The uh, uh, Board of Selectmen vote unanimously to support this motion. From the advisory board, Mr. Westerman. Uh, basically, the advisory committee recommends approval of this motion as well. We had a unanimous 7-0 vote on this article. Discussion. There being no one at the mic, this requires a majority vote. All those in favor signify by saying aye. All those opposed, so voted and declared unanimous. Article 9 on the motion, Mr. Vignani. Like 
I move that the town transfer from available funds, oops, I still move that. Um, Yeah, it says wastewater. I know. I Mike, would you give this to uh, Tony? Did you say sewer or transfer? Okay. My prop, my fault. Thank you. I move that the town transfer from available funds and wastewater enterprise uh, fund receipts the sum of two million four hundred and sixty two thousand two hundred and twenty three dollars and one hundred and eighty eight thousand four hundred and thirty six dollars from wastewater retained earnings and $660,974 from raise and appropriate for the purpose of funding wastewater treatment plant operations and expenses for the ensuing fiscal year of July 1st, 2014. In the amount of uh, personal services, $450,574 and other expenses in the amount of $2,861,059. It's been moved, seconded by Selectman O'Toole. Discussion, Mr. Vignani. Um, this is another enterprise fund that deals with our sewer. Um, the, revenue, uh, the revenue for this is about $2 million, and that comes from uh, the user fees, connection fees, permits, and the, the uh, disposals. Um, there's other revenue coming into that through betterments. As we do expansions in certain areas, those homeowners uh, contribute through betterments. And there's an override that comes in also in 1997 when we uh, upgraded the plant. That over. Um, that exclusion override expires in 2021. The expenses are about a million two hundred and seven hundred seventy thousand. Um, the uh, retained earnings in that account is a million sixty nine dollars, of which one hundred and eighty eight is going to be going towards the budget, as was mentioned, and two hundred thousand dollars will be going towards capital projects. The goals for this uh, enterprise fund are to expand our capacity. Um, the biggest goal right now is to finish the expansion of the 310 homes in the Squashcott area and also to reduce INI, which is inflow and infiltration. And this is water other than wastewater that gets into our treatment uh, program, or excuse me, our, our lines and has to be treated. So that's seawater, um, other water that's getting to the system and it costs a lot of money to process that. So the Board of Selectmen vote unanimously to support this motion. From the Advisory Board, Mr. Westord. It's easy following Tony, he does a great job. <laughs> the advisory committee recommends approval of this motion, a unanimous 7-0 vote. Discussion from the floor, gentleman at the center mic. Gordon Price, 48 Manlock Road. Is the current wastewater treatment facility operating at maximum capacity and if phase four, I think it was, uh, you know, moves forward, are we gonna be looking at some additional expenditures to increase the capacity? To answer the question, Selectman Vignani. It is not running at capacity. I don't know the exact percentage that it's running at, but we are pretty confident that it can take another phase worth of usage. Okay. Thank you. Any further discussion? There being none, this requires a majority vote. All those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. All those opposed, so voted and declared unanimous. Article 10, Selectman Vignani. Now we'll do the transfer station. I move that the town raise and appropriate the sum of $100,000 and transfer from transfer station receipts the sum of $1,086,244 for the purpose of funding the landfill and transfer station operations and expenses for the ensuing fiscal year commencing July 1, 2014, as follows. Personal services in the amount of $223,232 and other expenses in the amount of $963,012. Moved, seconded by Mr. Danahy. Discussion, Mr. Vignani. Um, transfer station, um, I see a lot of you there, so I know you know where it is. Um, the revenue for this uh, upcoming year is projected at a million three. Um, for the last three years, it's about that average. The, the place where we get the money for that is we get $470,000 for stickers, $490,000 from bags, 225,000 from bulky waste and 50,000 from recycling. Um, there is no increase in fees this year. The expenses are $318,000, of which the majority of it is hauling the trash away and the personnel. Um, the retained earnings in that enterprise fund is $674,000, of which $65,000 is going to be asked for in capital plan or was, was already approved for capital plan a minute ago. Um, the goals for that department are to replace some of the compactors, 
and to review some of the contracts to see if there's any savings there. And just a couple of footnotes, um, our town has improved our recycling percentage from 53 to 55%. So 55% of the stuff we haul out of here is recyclable. And also that department has, um, has fully utilized their crew during snow removal. So everyone that works at that plant when we have a storm is able to be trans uh, transferred over to help with the snow removal. And that saves the town money and gets things done quicker. So that's a great thing. And the Board of Selectmen vote unanimously to support this motion. From the advisory board, Mr. Westhorn. Again, this is another pretty easy one. As long as our blue bags don't go up, we know they're doing a good job. So the blue bags didn't go up. The advisory committee recommends approval of this motion with the unanimous 7-0. Discussion from the floor. There being no one at the mics, this requires a majority vote. All those in favor signify by saying aye. All those opposed, so voted and declared unanimous. Article 11, Selectman Danahy. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Mr. Moderator, I move the town transfer from available funds and the water enterprise receipts the sum of $2,658,000 one dollar for the purpose of funding water division operations and expenses for the ensuing fiscal year commencing on July 1st, 2014 as follows. Personal services, $808,763. Expenses, $1,849,238. Seconded by Mr. Harris. Discussion, Mr. Danny. Actually, discussion will be with Mr. O'Toole, Mr. Moderator. Mr. O'Toole. The Water Department budget includes the addition of uh, one full-time employee with the voter approval of uh, $22 million in water funds to overhaul the current water infrastructure. The department will be overseeing approximately seven miles of water pipe replacement each year for the next three years. And three contracts were awarded by the board on April 8th for the first phases. The work requires monitoring and oversight to ensure the work is properly done. The current retained earnings balance after town meeting is $1,816,453. From the advisory board, Mr. Westor. Basically, uh, they added one employee to you know, oversee the $22 million we just spent the last meeting. Um, the advisory committee recommends approval of this motion and the unanimous 7-0 decision. Discussion from the floor. Seeing no one at the mics, this requires a majority vote. All those in favor signify by saying aye. All those opposed, so voted and declared unanimous. Article 12, Selectman Danahy. Again. Mr. Moderator, I move the town raise and appropriate the difference between the levy net and the levy limit to the stabilization fund in accordance with the Massachusetts General Laws, Chapter 40, Section 5B. Seconded by Selectman Murray. Discussion, Mr. Danahy. Yeah, I, folks, I, certainly I think you probably have looked at the advisory uh, booklet, and of course it explains it. Uh, the one thing I wanted to make note is under the comment from the advisory, it says that uh, this is an annual article. It is. It authorizes the appropriation of funds um, into our stabilization fund, and we find out that number at the end of our budget. In this case, the book said 2014. Well, that can't be because we haven't gotten to June 30th. It's from 2000. Uh, 13, and so that that amount that we've been able to certify at the end of that year is then moved into the stabilization fund. What we're requesting is that we do the same again this year at the end of June 30th. From the advisory board, Mr. Jeffrey Burns. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Advisory unanimously supports the motion 7-0 in support of this article. It is an annual statutory article. Nothing further. Discussion, there being no one at the mics, this requires a two-thirds vote. All those in favor signify by saying aye. All those opposed, so voted and declared unanimous. Article 13, on the motion, select Mandanahy. Mr. Moderator, I move the town hear and act on the recommendations of the Community Preservation Committee on the fiscal year 2015 community preservation budget and pursuant to the Mass General Laws, Chapter 44B, appropriate community preservation funds as follows. One, $168,000 from community preservation fiscal year 2015 
estimated revenues to be reserved for the creation and support of community housing consistent with the Act. Two, $168,000 from Community Preservation Fiscal Year 2015, estimated revenues to be reserved for acquisition and preservation of historical resource, resources consistent with this Act. Three, $168,000 from Community Preservation Fiscal Year 2015, estimated revenues to be reserved for acquisition and preservation of open space consistent with this Act. Four, $84,000. Uh, dollars from Community Preservation Fiscal Year 2015 estimated revenues for administrative expenses of the Community Preservation Committee. Five, $784,000 for land for open space preservation, Damon Memorial Preserve. Six, $79,000 for historic resources, preservation of Bailey Ellis House. Seven, $23,000 for historic resources, Mossing Shed Transfer. Eight, $406,114 for recreational use, renovation of the Situate Skate Park. And nine, $375,000 for recreational use, creation of Tilden Multi-Use Trail. It's been moved, seconded by Mr. Murray. Um, under discussion, I think here's the way we'll handle it. Uh, We'll have a presentation from Ms. Lisa Fenton, Chairman of the Community Preservation Committee. We'll hear from the Board of Selectmen, from the Advisory Board. And uh, at the conclusion of the presentation, what I will do is I'll ask you to turn to page 38 in your Advisory Board booklet, and then I'll call off each of the nine items. We'll ask for holds. We'll go through the same routine as on the other multi-part items. Ms. Fenton. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, Mr. Danahy. Good evening. I'd like to first introduce our committee. We have Vice Chairman Harvey Gates, Frank Snow, Bill Limbacher, Josh McCain, Marla Manier, Camille Wells, Rob Carey, David Smith, Stephen Coulter, and our hardworking administrative assistant, Priscilla Grable. So tonight marks our 11th season supporting community preservation projects for the town of Situate. 11 years has afforded us the time and the funding to accomplish many worthwhile projects all around town, some of which are represented by the posters I hope you had a moment to look at as you came through the lobby tonight. As a historic seacoast town struggling to maintain our character and history while we develop and progress within the 21st century, Situate has the rare gift of community preservation legislation. Massachusetts is one of only a few states to support an act that not only seeks to preserve, protect, and restore our natural and historic resources, it also provides generous matching dollars. The Community Preservation Act is a derivation of the land banking process that originated long ago in Nantucket as they watched their little island develop. And what it guarantees is that for every acre that is developed there, a portion of open space is protected in perpetuity. The legislation has since expanded to acknowledge the importance of supporting historic preservation of buildings and archives, as well as the importance of supporting the preservation of our population in the form of affordable community housing. From foreshore protection to safe pedestrian byways, to preservation of town archives and acres of open, open space, and most recently the support of outside recreational activities, community preservation dollars have been there to protect and improve our town when no other funding source could. On that note, it's important that we acknowledge and thank our town and school administrations, our governing board of selectmen, and our financial advisory board for their responsible management of our town and school budgets. They have managed to keep Situate safe, productive, and academically healthy when many other towns in the Commonwealth have not. But by the time the schools are budgeted, the fire and police departments are funded, the snow and ice, health department, and shellfish budgets are balanced, there's very little left for the preservation, protection, and restoration of our town's historic and natural resources. And that is why Community Preservation Act is so important to the town of Situate. 
Tonight, our first four items are standard transfers from estimated revenues to four community preservation category reserves. Our next five items are our applications, and they are our priority projects for fis fiscal year 2015. The committee received 12 applications this season and has researched, vetted, discussed the merits of eligibility of each application and voted to support the five projects you have in front of you as important, constructive for the community, and in accordance with the town's master plan and open space recreation plans. Further, the committee has confirmed that each of these five projects meets our criteria as important CPA priorities in the categories of historical preservation, recreation, and open space preservation. As we launch ourselves into the future, don't disregard the importance and the uniqueness of our past. And as we evolve into the cyberspace technology invisibly zipping through the sky, keep in mind it's not a sky, unless there's an earth below it. So at the end of your chaotic work week, take a moment to turn off your iPhone, get out of your car, walk into the woods, and take a deep breath. And consider this, if money grew on those trees, we'd do anything to protect them. But keep in mind, they do provide the oxygen we breathe. In the spirit of Nantucket's land banking philosophy upon which the Act is based, our prime directive of the Community Preservation Act is open space preservation. Therefore, while there are still untouched acres of forest in situate, we have a responsibility to preserve our pristine lands. Because once the land is developed, we'll never get it back again. Thank you for supporting our projects tonight. From the Board of Selectmen, Selectman Danahy. The uh, Board of Selectmen voted unanimously to support all of the um, numbered, uh, I should say, items from the uh, CPA, with the exception of number five, the 784,000, the land for open space preservation, that's the Damon Memorial uh, Preserve, that was still supported, but it was a three to two vote. And item number six, the 79,000 for the historic resources, the preservation of the Bailey Ellis House, that too was supported, but it was a three to two vote. From the advisory board, Mr. Sandy. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, the advisory booklet, I think, for everybody here lays out a very detailed explanation of all the projects before us. And uh, Chairwoman Fenton did a wonderful job explaining the history of uh, CPC, uh, Situate's history with it. Um, I think it was, it's been a wonderful act and benefit for the town. Um, I would encourage if you want more information than, um, than we've outlined here in the comments and the write-up, um, on the Department of Revenue's site, they do a nice job of it explaining um, more about CPC, its background history, um, all the communities that are participating in it, the matches, etc. I know we're talking about years past, the match was, uh, was much higher than it is today, and for obvious reasons, it's, it's reduced down. I'm, I like to think that based upon the current economic condition with the State House and the positive numbers that have come through, that we'll see even a better match than what we saw last year. But I think if we look at opportunities for the for the town to receive matching whether that's through msba or through the library as we just talked about um you know this is another uh, a, a fine act and a method for the town to receive in here you know 26 23 cents on the dollar um and i think it's been a wonderful benefit to the town and something that i'm glad we see that, that we continue uh and good articles and good proposals are put forth um, the ones we see, such as today. Um, I will say that I would encourage uh, the members here and those in attendance and listening that if you do have articles, projects, proposals um, that fit within one of these criteria, to bring those, bring those up before the committee. Um, they have a wonderful website. 
list all the projects that they've done over the past number of years, wonderful projects. You can see a timeline, the application to submit a project that you think would be beneficial. If it meets within the criteria and um, allowed under the CPC rules, and I think many of you remember that last year, or it could have been the year before, they expanded out uh, the scope of projects that you could bring forth uh, before the CPC. So I would encourage, if you have a project, to bring forth. I think that was one of the, one of the projects as we see uh, before us uh, involving the, the skate park. I think it was a grassroots campaign that kind of led that. I think it's a wonderful article, and, and I think that's, those are the type of things that I think members here um, and the townspeople sh should use that or um, feel free to bring their own articles before. Um, on the recommendation, uh, since similar to Mr. Danny, he's uh, kind of a mixed uh, decisions uh, by the Board of Selectmen. As far as advisory, um, it's kind of a mixed, um, mixed vote on a few of the articles here. Uh, the Damon Memorial Preserve, that too generated a significant amount of discussion debate. Um, however, a majority uh, four to three were opposed to the article. Um, disapproval due to, um, it was just a majority opinion that the significant cost at 780 plus thousand uh, for the purchase of open space uh, did not support enough benefits to the town. And um, the town has, and we have approved and recommended significant open space purchases in the past years, but I think there were some issues uh, with this one. On the uh, Situate Skate Park renovation, um, a majority there was uh, voted uh, six to one in favor of that article. Um, and the only other one that was under discussion was the Tilden multi-use trail. Um, again, a lot of discussion on this. Um, the board voted a majority in four to three in support of the article, but we've had similar articles like this, these multi-use trails come before CPC and this board in the past, and some of the same uh, opinions in opposition to these trails uh, were simply that these type of trails should be something that's constituted within the operational DPW budget. Um, members of the board are kind of mixed on that. Um, and some other concerns uh, opposing this were that uh, some members of the board thought that Tilden Road, given its layout and logistics of it, um, could be a very difficult place to uh, propose a multi-use trail, even though it has significant benefits tying into the greater scheme of things. Um, so they thought that a better draft detail and a layout of where this will be, what side of the road uh, should be laid out before, uh, before it's approved. Um, and all of the other articles and the allocations were, were approved unanimously. Thank you. Okay. Uh, what I'm going to do now is go through items one through nine. If you want to discuss an item, call out hold. You don't have to go to a mic. We'll vote on everything that was not held and then come back and further discuss items that were held. Item one, $168,000. Item two, $168,000. Item three, $168,000. Item four, $84,000. Item five, $784,000. Hold on item five. Item six, $79,000. Hold on item six. Item seven, $23,000. Item eight, $406,114. Item nine, $375,000. So the items that are held are five, six, and nine. I'll accept a motion to approve all the unheld items. It's been moved and seconded. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed, so voted and declared unanimous. We return now to the held items, beginning with number five, and uh, gentleman to my left. 
Thank you, Mr. Moderator. William Ludlow, 241 Country Way. Since we had a split on the Board of Selectmen, I think I'd like to hear a minority report as to why these, they, certain people do feel that this expenditure may be too high for the parcels of land we're discussing. And also regarding the multi-use trail, that's a euphorism that covers a lot of different things. Maybe somebody could explain to me what a multi-use trail is, and apparently there are several of these trails proposed for situate. And I guess the question I have is, is as we expand, if we do expand multi-open uh, space properties and put them to better use, provide greater access to our citizens for these uh, parcels of land, which I do approve of. I guess it's fair to assume that this is going to be a further expense down the way for DPW and other projects as they go. So I think we have to look at appropriating money for open space and multi-use trails. There are some hidden costs involved, and I was hoping somebody could address that also. Thank you. All right. Uh uh, to explain the selectman's uh, recommendation, Selectman Danahy, then I'll ask uh, Chairman Fenton to address some of the other matters. Um, I was one of the ones that voted against this, um, this item from CPC, and it's not because of its open space. It's, I agree that open space is a very important element for, and it's a goal of this town, you the people. The thing is, is that there's a passive use and there's an active use of open space. By taking and accepting this as proposed, the 37.7 acres, it's going to be restricted by a conservation restriction. That restriction cannot be lifted unless you actually apply and petition Beacon Hill. So you, the people of the town of Situate, lose control over that. The restrictions hold, held by usually a third party, not the town. So when I looked at this article, I thought to myself, by spending $784,000, while it is a very good article for purposes of continuing to augment our open space, we here in town have a need for ball fields, recreational fields, athletic fields. And looking at this land unto itself, it's 37 acres, pretty much a flat land, which is ideal for recreational use. I would like to see it used twofold, multi-use, I'd like to see it used for maybe 10 acres of fields and the remaining uh, 27 acres as buffer for basically the restriction, if you will. In other words, that it would not be cleared at all. Presently, in the past 10 years, we spent over $4 million on 400 acres in the West End. You, the town of people, have, you, the town of Situate, have done that. And this is a need that I think we, the town, need for athletic fields. An example is a lacrosse field, um, thank you, a lacrosse field, we need really eight fields, for the, four for the boys, four for the girls. Two fields in, in, in and of themselves um, are basically an acre. So if we take eight acres, or rather four acres, you'd have eight lacrosse fields, which is a great opportunity for our town. Duxbury has it, Hingham has it, all the South Shore, many of the South Shore towns have this. Soccer field, for example. Again, you need almost 20,000 square feet, another four acres, then you'd have eight fields of soccer fields. Right now, we're gonna be having a, a proposed flag uh, football uh, this coming year for football fields. And our town is, is pretty much restricted with all of our fields. The lacrosse field right now, we only have two and a half. We use the football field, and then we use um, uh, gates as our half, and then there's the uh, field over in Flannery Field, which is um, Hadley School. So I just think for purposes of what the town needs in expending this amount of money, given what we've spent on open space with the conservation restriction, it would be in the best interest of the town to at least use a portion of it and not accept it with that restriction. I think we should accept it, but the applicant does not want to give it to the town without the restriction. And I disagree with the applicant on that point. So that's how I ended up coming to the conclusion that, you know, we, we should accept it. There, there's an argument that we're going to impact the water supply, and I disagree with that. If you put the fields close to um, 
to the entrance. And we're talking at the accessibility. It's at the end of Booth Hill Road. It's very accessible. And we can buffer all we want with the remaining 27 acres to protect our water supply. And I don't think fields are going to impact our water supply. So having said that, I know that the town, um, the two members on the Recreation Committee were not aware that this was a possibility that it could be used for recreational fields. And I know that the conservation agent was not aware of you know, this until actually it had been um, solicited to, to the Conservation Committee to accept it after the vote had taken place. And the DPW wasn't aware of this. So my feeling was from a transparency, transparency standpoint that uh, we need to go back and take a look at this and we need to tell the applicant while they want to give it to the town for that specific purpose, the town should decline it because we don't need it in that capacity. We want it for what we need it. So um, as I say, the, the last thing was the fact of the fields for the past 13 years, we have not increased them, means that we're going to kick the proverbial can down the road, meaning that we're going to need to buy fields. And the ideal situation about this, this tract of land is it's 37 acres. You know, you're going to be costing yourselves much more money in the future to try to find a parcel over here and find a parcel over there, because you're not going to be able to find something as large as this that will suit your needs. And that's the reason why I voted against it. Thank you. Uh, Chairman Fenton to answer the rest of the question. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. <clears throat> so first of all, I'd like to remind you that the Board of Selectmen did support the purchase of this piece of land. <clears throat> Secondly, I'd like to bring a couple things to your attention. Um, first of all, when the family who owns this property was approached to conserve this property. It's a very difficult decision. Um, this property has been in their family for longer than most of us have been in this town. <clears throat> they chose to preserve it as opposed to develop it and make a lot more money, by the way, because this open space property is very important to their heritage. It's also important to the town with regard to what it provides us in passive recreation, in water protection, and in adding to what was deemed very, very much a priority in our open space and recreation plan. The ball field piece. We do not purchase in community preservation open space property for conservation in order to then develop it for anything, including ball fields. If a proposal comes to us for space, in which the applicant would agree to have ball fields or other types of developments, affordable housing, put on it, we would certainly consider it joyfully and do that. But in this case, the property was presented to us as conservation of beautiful upland forest that connects to the rest of our conservation land up in the West End by virtue of ancient cart paths and woodland roads set up at a time when the woods were used for forestry, and still will be, by the way. So the ball field piece, we thought we had very well handled. Our legislation changed last year such that we can now fund recreation projects, new projects, purchase land as opposed to just restore land for recreation. And with that, the rec department came up with a very, very comprehensive plan and budget and a priority list that included inviting the entire community last year in on a discussion about what is needed for recreation and what the priority should be. So there is right now twice as much money in the recreation reserve that has not been expended, one point, over $1.4 million that recreation has at their disposal to fund their projects, and if at any time they want to change their mind on their priorities, they are at liberty to put the money back. We can rescind it and we can revote it for a another project, for instance, building or buying ball fields, of which right now we have space available, which when we had this discussion three or four times over the last two months, we identified property, perfect property, that would be available if they wanted it. Um, on, the, uh, on the Ellis property, there's 20 acres currently owned by the school. 
And if ball fields were that big a priority, that could be used. So we do have alternatives, and we have a budget to fund recreation fields from our recreation reserves. But we do not fund recreation projects through our open space reserves. That is reserved for open space conservation. Gentleman at the center mic. <clears throat> Excuse me. George P. Kelly, 450 Country Way. Mr. Kelly. Mr. Moderator, question. Sir. Can the amount be adjusted? Uh, the, the amount, well, when it comes to CPC recommendations, uh, there are two schools of thought on that. Uh, one school, which is the, the one I attend, is that the recommendation of the CPC is the recommendation that we vote on. There is a, another school of thought that says it can be amended downwards. I don't subscribe to that. Um, I believe that the CPC alone has the power to recommend an amount, and it's up to us to vote for it or not. May I make the amount that I wish to make as part of the record? Yes, sir. $500,000 to the family owning the land in question. Thank you. Uh, person to my right, lady in the pink jacket. Diane Wells, 117 Gilson Road. Um, Mr. Dennehy answered many of my reservations, so I'd like to underscore that. But I do have a residual question, and, and that is, on the parcels that are already purchased, they were planning on putting in trails and so forth. Are we going to have some additional expenses for this property? On the acres that we purchased in the past, has that been accomplished? So I have a real concern that this is going to be an additional burden for the taxpayers. Uh, Chairman Fenton, if you can answer the question. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, no, there is not an additional expense to the town. The money, by the way, this, this land um, was offered to us uh, at a little under $20,000 $20, per acre. The, um, this type of uplands, this upland woodland is extremely um, developable. It's also got two access points. It has been perked. It is all buildable. And um, they have had many offers. And they also had a subdivision um, created um, by Morse Engineering to show how the land could be subdivided and developed. And each one of those plots, similar plots, have been going for uh, up to five times as much per acre. So that land could be developed and built upon, and they, there would be a great deal of profit for the families if they were to do that. If the town purchase it, included in that purchase price, is also the um, about $25,000 for a small parking lot and signage. The legal fees are covered under that price. And then what we, we have a conservation restriction put on it, which, by the way, a conservation restriction is a very good thing. What it means is when the conservation restriction is written up, which is done by our own conservation commission, with the input of the community, certain things are established that can be done on that land and things that cannot be done on that land. And a conservation restriction is held to make sure that uh, in perpetuity of this uh, land purchase, that nothing is ever done to that property um, without, due due, without due notice to the holder of the conservation restriction, meaning it's kept in conservation as open space for the community. Given the restrictions for conservation and the restriction by the family, isn't there any way around that to still be able to use this for multi-purpose uses? Well, could that... Right now, passive recreation is, is very multi-used. Um, we intended to keep the land productive from a woodland point of view. There is, uh, as I mentioned before, ancient cart paths that are walkable and bikeable. Um, there's lots of different types of hiking and camping. We've got 
um, Girl Scout groups who have created the, uh, the, the geo-searching uh, scavenger hunts on this type of property. There's many, many uses for it, but the uses that we would approve of would be uses that did not require the cutting down of trees and the paving and, and resurfacing for ball fields. With a considerable span of 37 acres, it just seems like there could be some portion that could be carved out for the ballpark fields and also yet preserve the water supply. Again, we have property and funding available for ballparks, but we don't use open space dollars to make ballparks. Gentleman to my left. I'm Peter Kelly Detweiler, 114 Tilden Road. Um, I actually speak with two hats, one as um, a member.